I was born November 7th, 1959 in Millbury, Massachusetts. Growing up as a boy, I didn't have a bad home, but it was a very dysfunctional home. There was really a lot of arguing, no affection of any kind. Never heard the words, I love you. My folks never said it to each other, and I don't recall us kids ever hearing it. In the teenage years, it seems like everything was just rebellion against my parents, against law enforcement. I started basically my drinking and drug career at about 14 years old. It had a huge impact on school. I mean, parents today, they're pushing for their kids to get A's or they're not happy. My folks would have a celebration if I brought home D's. I remember one year in, in high school, in biology, I got a final average of a six, and the teacher spelt it out S-I-X, so I couldn't change it on the report card. And my sister started going to a teen outreach in Millbury called His Place Coffee House. She repeatedly kept trying to get me in, I mean, because of course she could see the downward spiral I was in. Yeah, matter of fact, I met my girlfriend at his place, coffee house. I was 17, doing things kids do unsupervised. She wound up pregnant. I was excited, having no idea what was ahead. At 18, I got married. My son was born. BJ, Bobby Jr., and I failed the crash course in adulthood. Through his place, I did kind of start getting my life together, but I just couldn't handle the responsibility. I started ripping and running back into the bars. I was old enough to sneak into bars underage at that point. I wound up a few years later, a daughter being born. Jen, and it all lasted about five years till my wife at the time gave me an ultimatum of the children or the alcohol and drugs. I chose the alcohol and drugs. I walked out of their life and moved to Cape Cod. My parents had separated divorced and my dad moved back here to Lincoln County. My mom, I mean, as dysfunctional and everything was, she didn't want the divorce. He said he was heading down south to see if he could find work. The next thing she knew, she was getting a letter in the mail saying he wanted a divorce, which hurt her greatly. So she just stayed up there. Knowing my life was spiraling, he figured he'd try to get me down here. I mean, I was trying to do a little construction up there, but that was, work was really slow. He had a, a business here, so he talked me into coming to Lincoln County and working with him, and he could help straighten my life out. Because he had actually become a pastor in the Cumberland Presbyterian Church here. When my dad died, it, I was sad, I guess, but there was no great mourning there. Probably because of the disconnection that we did have, but there was still also a lot of alcohol involved and it probably kept it numb. When my mother passed away, it had been so long since I talked to her, she had no idea whether I was alive or dead. That thought running through your head all the time, you would think would change you, but it didn't. Just life itself was just completely spiraling, nothing making sense, nothing meant anything to me anymore. But that final DUI, 
New Year's Eve 2001, coming back from Alabama, I got stopped. And I decided then it was something needed to be done. So I started going to church, what I now refer to as playing church. I was going into the building, listening to a guy tell me about Jesus and how I was supposed to keep my butt out of hell. But that did absolutely nothing for the inside of me for my life. But we, I went to court, and I'll never forget the judge's name, Judge Moquin, which from what the deputies and everyone said, I had the hanging judge. She held the record for DUI convictions in the state of Alabama. She wanted to give me five years in the state penitentiary, which was God seeding things in me, I guess to set up my change. They wound up giving me three months in the new Madison County Jail, which I was mad at God at because I had started going to church. I had asked forgiveness. Everything was supposed to be good. I'm not supposed to be paying for none of this. I, I confessed it, but I still did three months. When I got out, Alabama takes DUIs a little more serious than Tennessee did at the time. I had to do DUI classes, which cost $250 just for the class. But one of the questions I asked was, how much has this offense cost you? From legal fees, time out of work, any monetary thing. I stopped counting at $10,000. That got my attention. Looking back on it now, the three months that I got instead of five years that I should have been thankful for, God knew it would take that much time for it to sink in. In 2003, he started setting up different circumstances that put me in the lives of kids, around kids, which brought back memories of his place, Coffee House, which was in 1976. I was actually called to youth ministry then and ran, and he was kind of setting that up again, and I could see it coming. There was a little country church that I would pass every day, and I'd see the kids out there, and I could literally hear, that's the church you're supposed to go to. You're supposed to be part of that. And I'd pass by and say, no, God, that is a Presbyterian church. I'm Pentecostal. I don't belong at that church. <laughs> but it went on and on. I wound up running across these kids at a yard sale. They were doing stuff for their youth group, a trip. Just continually running across them. And I finally went in one day and turned out to be the most loving bunch of kids, which that little country church that I didn't want to go to wound up birthing the basement, which is the name of the youth ministry that come out of Kiros. And over the years, we started getting a lot more adults in, a lot more older college age. And I would tell God, I said, these aren't teens. Was, this is the basement. And this took four or five years to get to this point. And I'm like, no, this isn't teens. And God said, but what did I set up back then? And I remembered it was Kiros. It wasn't youth, it was Kiros. And that just started a whole snowball of fun events. We had a lot of self-injurers come in due to depression. And I'd look at the kids, I'm like, God, I don't understand this. I said, how can a kid cut himself or why? And God reminded me of the old bread truck my dad used to have parked outside that I used to punch until my knuckles bled. These kids helped me through that. We had the goth kids. 
boys with black eyeliner and black nails, which really kind of freaked me out a little one night at the basement. I walk in, look in the men's room, six guys looking in the mirror putting eyeliner on, and I looked at them and I said, now what is wrong with this picture? <laughs> I knew it was because there was something wrong, which is why they felt they needed it. I'm like, God, I don't understand this. Why do they choose to be so different? And God said, do you remember the army fatigue jacket you wore all the way through school? In the summer, in the heat. I understood them a little bit more and it helped me work through the stuff I was dealing with then. It's just been so many things from the basement that just uprooted even what I thought the good parts of me. The kids at the basement wound up teaching me and changing me a lot. Of course, being an adult, thinking you know what you're doing and you set out to help people, it kind of gets reversed on you. Some of the most spiritual growth that I've ever gotten was from the basement. I said, through that history of alcoholism and everything, I battled that even being at the basement, white knuckling through the alcohol. But I remember taking some of the kids to a Casting Crowns concert, and I stepped off to the side to get pictures of them, and while they were worshiping, <laughs> I looked at them. And my prayer was for God to make himself real to them not a religion, real. And I guess that's when I got it. It literally felt like God opened up my chest and climbed in. Every urge and craving I had for alcohol and drugs from that point on was gone. I understood what the relationship part of it was. God was real. He wasn't somebody in a book. He wasn't someone you read about in the Bible. He become real and it changed everything. When we started the basement, I was, I was married. In a very unhealthy marriage, we'll call it. I was at the basement on weekends. She was right down the street in the bar. But I wasn't gonna ask for the divorce and have that mark that the kids could look back on in a negative way that would hurt them in a negative way. But she got fed up, finally decided wanted a divorce because I wasn't leaving God and the kids. So we got a divorce and I was actually living at the basement at the time after the divorce in a little 10 by 10 room I called home. But I was there 24 seven for the kids that way, which turned out to be a good thing. But I was walking through the basement one night, and I looked up, I said, God, you know, I could really use a little help here. Because by this point, a lot of the volunteers had left. There was a few of the diehards. One of the founders was still there with me. So I went in, checked my space. That'll show you how long ago that was. And uh, put different stuff with the kids. And someone had told me about Shout Life, which was kind of a Christian MySpace. So I checked that page, which I had for the ministry, and I wound up running across my wife now on Shout Life. They had a thing if someone new joined, it showed all the new members you were supposed to get on there, welcome them to Shout Life and all this stuff. And I get on, for some reason I clicked her profile after to read a little bit farther after wel welcoming her. And the different posts she had on there about religion 
It wasn't religion, it's a relationship kind of thing, the stuff I had come out of, and I just simply put, I like the way you think. And she responded back, well, that normally gets me in trouble, and we had a good laugh about it. And so we messaged back and forth, and in looking on her profile, she was in South Carolina. So I'm like, okay, Lord, I have no idea what you got going here. I knew there was, we were connected for a reason. And all our conversations revolved around youth. And I'm like, okay, we know the basement's supposed to branch out in other areas as maybe I'm supposed to help her set one up in South Carolina. Approximately six months later, after physically seeing her about six times, driving down there to visit, we were married. It turned out she was supposed to be here helping me with this youth outreach. That was going on seven years ago. A good seven years. Looking at my life now, my relationship with God, such contrast from what I thought a relationship was supposed to be. It's, I really can't even put, describe it into words. I'll, it is the most exciting time of my life. I don't serve a God. I commune with God. I used to read that, how Adam communed with God, walked with God. I'm like, how can you walk with God? You can. God today is literally my best friend. I walk down the street and we literally have conversations, two-way conversations, which I thought was nuts which a lot of people probably think I'm nuts if they're seeing me walking down the street. It is completely personal. The things he has me doing are so far above me and out of anything I can do, it's not even funny. I mean, we talk about Peter getting out of the boat. I don't even see the boat anymore. When I stepped out, I learned I don't have to get back in. It's scary on the outside of the boat, but I ain't getting back in the boat. I used to look at surrender as a weakness. Surrender was easy once I realized what it was. Let the crap go. When you give God control, things just happen. I wish I could put into words the way my life feels today. I mean, materialistically, I have so much less. I mean, there was a point in my past back when I was selling drugs, and I mean, I had more money than I knew what to do with. Doing construction now, a bill comes in, it's like, ah, oh, I don't even know if I can pay this. But I'm happy. It makes no sense to the world, but I'm happy.